Today, technology has brought us closer together, not only through communication, but also through our daily financial transactions. The ASEAN region has close economic links with large numbers of tourists and workers abroad. Therefore, we need to have convenient, fast and secure payment systems. Currently, there are still limitations to cross-border payment and remittance services. These include complicated procedures, high fees, long waiting times and lack of tracking capability. Transacting through unregulated channels may be insecure. In Thailand, PromptPay, a fund transfer service using mobile phone, has been a game-changer in payments and fund transfers since 2017. Building on this success are cross-border payment services to make international transactions even easier. The Bank of Thailand, together with other ASEAN central banks, aim to link up payment and remittance networks through the ASEAN Payment Connectivity Initiative. This will provide new alternatives that meet the needs of tourists, migrants and businesses for fast and convenient cross-border payments and remittances. With a common goal, ASEAN central banks have joined hands to create cross-border, real-time QR payment and remittance linkages to facilitate tourism, trade and investment, as well as promoting the use of local currency. The collaborations also strengthen the ties of our regional economic integration. The synergy between central banks and financial sector will benefit the people, businesses and countries in achieving the goal of digital economy, which will eventually contribute to continuous and sustainable regional economic growth. Thailand has linked with the following ASEAN countries starting with Laos in 2019. Cambodia in 2020. And in 2021, four more countries have been linked. Vietnam. Singapore. Malaysia and Indonesia. These linkages enable tourists to purchase goods and services by scanning merchants' QR codes with their mobile applications without the need for cash or cards. Moreover, cross-border remittance services allow migrant workers to transfer money home or individuals can transfer to friends or families abroad. This linkage is recognized as the world's first cross-border, real-time remittance service. This linkage will set a new standard for cashless payments in this region, which is fast, convenient, secure and with lower costs. Not only will these services benefit the people and businesses, they will also support regional economic activities. And in the future, we will continue to pursue cross-border payment connectivity and support innovations to enhance connectivity and financial inclusion, as well as to promote efficient business transactions for the betterment of our country and region as a whole. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's panel discussion for the BOT FinTech Fair. And today we'll be having a story panel of specialists who will be talking about uh, cross-border payment connectivity in ASEAN and its implications for the rest of the world. My name is Daniel Wu. I'm from AWS, leading the financial services public policy portfolio, and I will be your moderator for today. Joining me today, I'm so pleased to introduce this distinguished cast of panelists. Uh, we have four folks joining us from across the region today. Uh, first, we have Mr. Sopnendu Mohanty, who is the Chief FinTech Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where he has been one of the world's most foremost 
innovation leaders for the past six years, building on his prior two decades experience in tech and innovation at City. Next, we have Ms. Tara Rice, who is head of the CPMI Secretariat of the Bank of International Settlements, where she's overseeing work on standards for payments, clearing, and settlement, and where prior to that, she led a strong public service record with the U.S. Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury. On the private sector side, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Kun Payong Srivanik, who is president of Krum Thai Bank, but today joins us in his capacity as chairman of the Thai Bankers Association. He brings with us 20 years of experience in the banking industry to this conversation, and he has been driving a lot of work on building Thailand's payment infrastructure and connectivity. And lastly, very pleased to welcome our guest from Indonesia, uh, Mr. Abraham Adrians, who is Managing Director of Rintis Sajatra, and joins us today in his capacity as Chair of the Retail Payment System Committee of the Indonesia Payment System Association, where he has led nation-building work with Bank Indonesia on the National Chip Card Standard, National QR Standard, and the National Payment Gateway Project. So it's a pleasure to have all of you here today. Thank you for joining us. So without further ado, let's get started on the panel today. We're gonna to be discussing and reviewing where cross-border payment connectivity stands today. We'll be exploring a little bit the COVID-19 vector and what that means for payments domestic and cross-border. And lastly, we're gonna ask our panelists to reflect on what we've learned today and how it might apply for the momentum going forward as we see even more cross-border payment connectivity take place across the region. So let's get started. For, for payments, it's been very clear that the current landscape for cross-border payments still has some persistent pain points. Speed, cost, convenience, transparency are all incredibly important factors that affect the entire ecosystem, consumers, merchants, issuers, acquirers, and even central banks now increasingly play a role in driving that collaboration under the ASEAN Payment Connectivity Initiative to promote financial integration by linking up payment networks. Ideally, we'd see a world where tourists, migrants, SMEs, everyone in the region can stand to benefit from that cross-border payment and remittance services, but most importantly, through new interfaces, for example, QR. And in fact, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's a, a new opportunity to explore how we might leverage these linkages for e-commerce transactions. So let's get started on hearing from our panelists today. Uh, I'd like to first draw our attention to PromPay and PayNow, which is one of the more exciting linkages that has happened in recent memory. Uh, so, uh, so Nendu, I'd like to turn the first question to you. Uh, in the context of the PromPay PayNow linkage, could you tell us a little bit more about, help us understand about the current update, where things stand, the latest statistics, what was the value proposition? We'd love to hear someone who has been at the front row of this development. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. The, and. Uh, this particular partnership we had with uh, Thailand, connecting uh, Singapore's pay now to Thailand's from pay, was truly a game changing because it is the first time ever two countries are connecting the respective domestic payment system for a cross border transfer. And uh, it took us uh, three years to get there uh, from a very uh, macro benefit coming out of this particular connectivity is because it's, it's around this whole, uh, both countries focus around their own domestic payment system getting better. Uh, both Singapore and Thailand uh, have dramatically upgraded their respective payment infrastructure in their respective market by using something called proxy identifier, which means in the respective market, people can pay each other by just knowing each other's mobile phone number in the case of Singapore, it is mobile phone number and national ID. So that simplifies the whole complexity of understanding, knowing, need to know any, the account details, bank details before you spend money. Uh, just to give a, a, a little more explanation on the domestic side, in Singapore, you can pay each other using, uh, using uh, pay now with just three clicks, zero cost, uh, and, and just knowing the respective uh, uh, your, your your benefits is the mobile phone number. 
Now this, uh, so what we decided that these two countries will connect that same system, a similar system, and see whether we can replicate the same experience we give to our domestic market. So uh, three years, uh, we went live uh, five months back. Uh, today, uh, somebody from Singapore and same for Thailand can send money across by just knowing the other person's mobile phone number. That's the simplicity of this infrastructure. Second, the whole transaction runs through a banking rail. So the full KYC, money, uh, um, sanction checking, money laundering checking, everything goes through that process. It's a trusted rail and money flows through, through rails where it is being monitored for all possible uh, challenges of cross-border transfer. And more importantly, the cost of transfer. But that has been a big pain when it comes to moving, uh, sending money overseas. Uh, uh, the World Bank average is somewhere between 11 to 12 percent for every hundred dollar you send across. Uh, we have achieved in this particular connectivity uh, close to three percent of cost of sending uh, money across. So for every hundred dollar you send across, the cost is three dollar, including of fees and the FX charges. Now, can they be better? Yes, that can get better. We'll talk about it later. Uh, the impact of the uh, of the of the project five months. Uh, almost uh, $20 million worth of small value transfer has moved, uh, 70 million transactions. But I want to leave the audience with a very important data, which perhaps to me the most striking uh, outcome of this connectivity is the ticket size of the transfer. The size of the transfer has fallen down from $1,000 above to $300 only. What it says is that the small value transfer, which is now coming to the channel, reflects that the immigrant workers or people are sending money back home don't have to wait for a couple of weeks till they get a certain size of money before they can transfer the money back home because the cost should justify that that size. Now it is down to $300. The frequency has increased, which means they can respond to their family's need from overseas frequently and able to send small value transfers easily. So to me, that is a huge financial inclusive impact, it truly really goes to show how, it's, how a, a public infrastructure can make a dramatic impact on people's life. And I hope that this also provides the necessary foundational rail for a lot of fintech companies to take advantage of this rail and further make the process of transfer simpler, cheaper, secure. I think that's what we saw in the, as part of this whole uh, game-changing, first-of-a-kind first connectivity. That sounds amazing. And in fact, it's, I think all the signs point to a really, really encouraging start. You know, it sounds like a lot of work needed to be put in place at the infrastructure layer, also tying together collaboration from many players on both sides of the, of, of, of the fence. Could you tell us a bit more, what do you think were the key success factors that drove this collaboration? Was it domestic? Was it regional? A little bit of both. And what do you think the experience of Prompe and Pay Now uh, would signal for the rest of the landscape that are attempting similar connectivity? Well, the, as I said, that it took us three years to connect the two networks, despite we have a similar infrastructure, a kind of similar infrastructure in both market. Why did it take us so much time? Because we had to bring policy alignment between the two countries. The policy alignment are all mostly within the clearing process because the respective country have different SLAs, uh, different uh, infrastructure, uh, different uh, design of how the proxies are created. So it's very, uh, so we've got to find a way to find a common path of how do we bring these processes, SLS, system connectivity, system uh, processes into a, to a common set of rules. So this money can be moved instantly at, at the price point we're talking. So that is one learning we took that there's a need for a greater policy alignment between countries so that we can approach, approach this more efficiently. And just to give a, a, a real uh, outcome of this connectivity, because we took three months, we understood the complexity of cross-border connectivity. We just announced our India connectivity, which will go live first quarter next year. So we are talking about going live in, in, in almost uh, nine months from the day it was announced, which was last week. As against three years, we took to connect to Thailand. It definitely shows that we have learned a lot and enhanced our system design to be able to connect faster. A week after that, we also announced our connectivity to Malaysia. 
same account to account corridor again committed to go live in early part of next year we can now co connect to countries faster especially uh, countries around us because we now understand the, the design requirement to bring all this together but let me remind that this is only a part of the solution we are talking about account to account transfer of connecting countries with respective domestic payment system there's a huge progress in asian market especially what thailand is driving is whole the qr payment piece because qr payments facilitates merchant acceptance singapore did sg qr last a couple of years back bring all the qr payments to a common standard thailand is also doing the same thing many malaysia is also doing the same thing now the qr payments are also getting connected by respective qr payment operators that's a huge progress in asian market and our own fintech players have grown dramatically pushing payment infrastructure to uh, to to a cost structure which is less than a percent so my point is that the asian growth in the space has been dramatic the system design and the process simplification has been very organic they have not waited for a global standard to come out before they can connect the systems they have just moved by the by the force of nature of people demanding better connectivity that's awesome it sounds like the policy alignment the learnings from system designs allow you to shorten the technical discussions in subsequent linkages i think those are super important things i'm going to come back to that at the very end when we talk about what are the learnings that we can apply for future connectivity uh, now let's tackle this from a slightly different angle uh, from a bank's perspective uh kun payong again it's a pleasure to have you here join us on our panel today you know uh so nandu talked a little bit about how the project took three years. So if you work backwards, it means that the project started before COVID. It went live sometime during the COVID pandemic, and then therefore it'll continue to persist after COVID presumably becomes somewhat an endemic. So could you tell us a little bit more how you see PromPay Pay now becoming a driver, reflecting on when it started before the COVID-19 pandemic, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed your perception and you know what might the future look like for PromPay and PayNow, and what we might learn from it after that. We'd we'll love to hear some of your perspectives as a as a bank. Well, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. The accelerating shift in consumer behavior that has been driven not only by the technology shift and also the pandemic and the new business business model that we have seen, uh, and it's been cutting across many aspects of businesses regionally. Uh, uh, the banking industry itself has been going tremendous changes over the past few years. And, and we've seen that it's been instrumental part of enabling consumers and businesses to achieve higher efficiency and expand their capabilities. And PromPay PayNow is a good example of how banks, through strong collaboration with partners, regulators uh, uh, across uh, between Thailand and Singapore, can drive meaningful impact for consumers and businesses by leveraging existing infrastructure and overcoming constraints through the use of technology, the new framework, adjusting for the in each country specific while ensuring appropriate risk mitigation relating to the services. Um, we've done that pretty well. The service enable uh, the low cost real time cross-border multi-currency payments, and especially in compliance with AMLO PDPA ISO 20022 standard. The number of transactions has been growing steadily despite the pandemic. We believe that the service will become the preferred real-time remittance platform for small value transfer seamlessly, bridging cross-border transactions. We've seen in the past five months, we've seen the uh, average uh, volume has grown to uh, from Singapore to Thailand, uh, average per ticket of uh, $263 Sing dollars. Uh, and from Thailand to Singapore has been growing uh, to 497 Sing dollars. And the, uh, the, 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 the level has been growing steadily uh, month on month. And more importantly, the expansion of the service and collaboration to other corridors has just been highlighted between Singapore and Malaysia and across uh, uh, to other countries in the region will create a network effect that could become one of one of a kind of collaboration 
that serve as a role model for other services across the region as well. This will uplift the competitiveness of the region and ensures security and stability of critical infrastructure within each partner countries without solely relying or being dependent on others of global standard. Providing cross-border payment services efficiently and cost-effectively is also one of the United Nations uh, SDGs. The goal is to reduce the average remittance cost to less than 3% by 2030. And with digital being a prominent alternative to cash, the cost of remittance has been falling. Globally, the cost of digital remittance has fell to 5%, according to the World Bank report. And prompt pay pay now, uh, as we've seen the trend in the past five months, is likely to going to become a major system offering convenience and secure choice with low fee and competitive against the alternative, the other alternatives. Thank you very much, Kun Payong. That sounds like there is a strong conviction about the prospects of Prompt Pay now. I think it's a very exciting piece of work. And I think uh, Kun Payong, Sopnandu, both of you actually talked about something in, in common, which is a standards. And I think now it's a good time to pivot to, to Tara to hear a little bit about the topic of standards. Uh, so Tara, I know Prompt Pay and Pay now, we, as we've heard, they've established an interlink between the domestic payment systems, but clearly standards had a role to play here. So from the perspective of the CPMI Secretariat, what role do you see standards playing in driving this connectivity and not just where it is now, but also with future corridors? Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's really exciting to hear about the cross-border payment developments in the region. Um, so let me, we've talked about specifics, but let me provide a little bit of a conceptual perspective to the discussion. Um, so our cross-border payments program, uh, the FSB roadmap, um, lays out 19 building blocks or projects to enhance cross-border payments. The CPMI is the owner of 11 of those. Um, and under one of the building blocks, um, building Block 13, we're investigating how interlinking payment systems can mitigate the frictions of cross-border payments. And so we have um, started our work by analyzing the pros and cons of interlinking arrangements and specifically for different types of links. Not all links are the same. Um, we're developing a framework for interlinking and um, some of the key features of that is going to include a, so a desirable end state, and issues around design, operational, policy, and risk considerations. And I'll come back to the policy piece in a moment. Um, so we um, differentiate actually between three types of, of links between banks or cross-border payments, uh, payment system providers in two or more countries. There's the single access point model. And this is where um, participants in one payment system have access to another payment system through uh, a shared single entity. So an example of this would be between the Remimbi chats in Hong Kong and um, the payment systems of mainland China. This is a link between RTGS systems that primarily um, service wholesale transactions. Uh, then there's the direct link model, and this is the prompt pay, pay now model. This is where two payment systems are directly connected um, so that any participant one system can reach all participants in the other. Um, and then the third model is a hub and spoke model. And that includes a variety of multilateral interlinking arrangements, which link more than two systems. So an example of this would be the regional payment and settlement system um, of the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa. So why did I lay out these models? Because they have different, as I said, costs and benefits. Um, all of them, however, to the extent that they can harmonize um, business and, and technical operational rules, um, are likely to improve payments and improve data quality. And this is where um, policy alignment is really important. Um, but it's not just the policy alignment, which is, which is and can be a challenge. Interlinking arrangements also needs political support across borders um, and funding to, to, to cover startup costs. Um, still, um, you know, there's barriers like the div divergent regulatory frameworks and oversight arrangement and system rules. These are being covered under the cross-border payment program as well under a different set of building blocks. Um, and so to, to actually enable interlinking, we need to bring a lot of things together at the same time. 
um, when we kicked off, just last two points, when we kicked off our work um, on cross-border payments, we did a survey among 82 central banks. And it actually showed that interlinking appears to be the exception rather than the rule. While it is becoming more common, um, it's, um, it's not yet uh, fully developed, let's just say. But um, some exciting news, um, and I'll close with this, is that there are 14 payment systems reporting that it's possible they'll establish additional international links with other payment systems, like in the next five years. And so our hope is that the forthcoming, uh, with our forthcoming CPMI interlinking framework and real world examples, we can support payment system operators that would consider establishing new links. Thank you. Tara, that sounds really exciting. And it sounds like payment systems themselves have a role to play in this infrastructure connectivity, especially again, some of the models and examples you shared in other regions. So I think this is a, an amazing segue uh, to Pat Abraham uh, from Indonesia, who represents today the Indonesia Payment System Association from, a, from the perspective as a payment system operator. Uh, Pat Abraham, uh, welcome again. Just, we'd love to hear some of your perspectives on the bilateral connectivity for cross-border payments. And we'd love to hear a little bit more about how Indonesia and the work that you're doing and how ASEAN payment connectivity is coming into play. And most importantly, uh, how do you see your role as a payment system operator against this backdrop and undercurrent? Okay, thank you, Daniel. I think what we what we, I will uh, explain is really aligned with the other speaker has already uh, brought up. Uh, firstly, I mean, the industry is really appreciated by Bank Indonesia and uh, Bank of Thailand on their leadership and support of this cross-border uh, QR code collaboration. As you know, I mean, both countries have long history of uh, card-based cross-border interlinkage already. Uh, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, since 2006. And the first and foremost benefit for the industry is a more efficient cross-border infrastructure, Sarah because we can utilize the existing uh, cross-border infrastructure, for example, like IPVPN, uh, STAR, STYLE, and then uh, when we connect to the IPVPN, and basically we connect to uh, any countries. And also uh, on the establishment of the uh, speed of execution with this new QR interface technology. So it really helps the financial institution, banking and non-banks, to, accelerate, uh, to move forward from the chicken and egg simulation, which what come first, to execution. So just to give you uh, the illustrative comparison, uh, previously it took almost two up to four years for ASEAN banking industry to develop and enhance uh, card-based cross-border uh, connectivity between the country due to various chip card standards, the uh, interoperability and costly network customization. But with this uh, cross-border QR code, I mean, thanks to both piloting participants and also the BI and BOT, uh, from the technical point of view and the uh, set up the system, it took only six months. And we believe, I mean, once we uh, completed the business model and also the uh, acceptable risk level, and most likely, I think we, we, we can move faster for cross-border with the upcoming countries like Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and then Vietnam, and also Philippines and other uh, ASEAN countries. And uh, let me talk about the Indonesian uh, cross-border, you know, Ind Indonesian QR code uh, standard implementation. When we implement uh, last year uh, for the national uh, QR code, uh, in Indonesia, the take up of the uh, small and medium enterprise of the QR code merchant, it goes from 500, uh, uh, yeah, 500,000 uh, per month into 1 million uh, small and medium enterprise merchant uh, per month. So, I think it's really a game changer for us, I mean, domestically. But I mean, we look forward also to, again, I mean, do the uh, cross-border QR with uh, Thailand and others because uh, basically the cross-border uh, 
QR code transaction will generate the adding added value of the domestic side of the payment transaction and it will also strengthen the final inclusion to the small and medium enterprise uh, merchant so again we look forward for the again the launching of this QR code uh, cross border with Thailand and I mean from the point of view of the operator uh, we are thankful for the development of the infrastructure which we have already developed probably since uh, 10 years ago and we can utilize it in a more effective and efficient way. Thank you very much Pak Abraham. I think this is a good opportunity to take this outside in versus the inside out view as we zoom back into Thailand. Uh, Maybe over to Kun Payong again. You know, we, we hear a lot about the bilateral connectivity with other ASEAN corridors and the fact that consumers and merchants stand to benefit. You know, earlier in, in your remarks, you told us a little bit about how that has started to change the behavior of consumers and merchants in the countries. And we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. You know, given the QR standards that Thailand has piloted, Indonesia is launching this SGQR and now with the bilateral payment connectivity, how do you think that might change the behavior and the use cases for consumers and merchants? For example, would they even go as far as to using this to drive cross-border e-commerce? Tell us a little bit more about how you see that changing, maybe reflecting on uh, pre-COVID, but also how COVID itself might have changed the game a little bit. Sure. Um... Through interoperability, the cross-border QR aims to eliminate uh, frictions in such transactions by utilizing transaction service that consumers and businesses are already familiar with. In Thailand, QR is a widely used and known method of payment among micro, small, and medium-sized businesses due to convenience, safety, speed, and cost with interoperability, enabling users from a partnering country to make QR payments in another through QR translation mechanism. These businesses stand to benefit from ability to accept cross-border payments without any additional investment. Just as with the face-to-face -face payment, the tremendous growth in e-commerce and particularly cross-border e-commerce has prompted the industry to find better payment solutions, of which cross-border QR is definitely a viable option among others. While additional development will need to be designed and implemented to accommodate system and processes within each partner country, just as we have done with the cross-border remittance and face-to-face -face QR payment, with strong collaboration and shared objectives, we believe this can be achieved. In the current environment, where consumers and businesses are presented with many different solutions, especially driven by new players aiming to find better ways to better meet their needs, it is very critical for banks to innovate, collaborate, and con continuously offer better solutions to customers and play a key role in driving economic development. SMEs should benefit from easier means of payment, facilitating tourist spending, uh, particularly post-pandemic when countries started to be opening up. Before COVID, around 1.2 million tourists from Singapore comes to Thailand annually, and about half a million of Thai tourists go to Singapore annually as well. The Thai merchants are certainly very familiar with and welcoming QR payment Due to the implementation of various government support and stimulus program, particularly during the pandemic, for example, the uh, half to ha half of the half uh, spending uh, that the government helped paying uh, to buy uh, the uh, small uh, merchants and street foods uh, has already accommodated around 1 million merchants across the country. So that will be a uh, very, uh, something that uh, uh, definitely can be very uh, hopeful and it can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kun Payong. Uh, Kun Payong, I really like the part where you talked about 
there's going to be an increased interest to innovate on the services that are provided from the payments perspective, you know, whether it's fintechs or whether it's the banks themselves reinventing the way financial services and payments are delivered. Maybe this is a good opportunity to turn to a, to get a central banker's perspective. Uh, so Nando, I'd like to turn over to you again. Uh, with this cross-border payment connectivity, what does that mean for the level of comp competition, the barriers to entry, and the level of innovation that we might see from a cross-border payment perspective, how much, to what extent is this a game changer and to what extent do you see this actually happening? Love to hear some of your perspectives. Well, uh, my, my sense is that uh, we have to split between foundational connectivity and innovations. Let's, let's be very clear. We are, the, the role of public good is not to go and build solutions but commercial parties will do more efficiently. Our job as a central banker is to focus on putting the right policies in place and build the or support the foundational layer. Uh, let me explain the foundational layer very, very uh, carefully because uh, sometimes we, we, we think that why central banks, why government of Thailand and Singapore building this payment connectivity, is it not something market players can build it themselves? There are all sorts of questions which come to the market today. Let me explain this uh, clearly. So there are four foundational infrastructure any country must have to be called truly a digital economy. One is a trusted digital identity system. Second, a trusted gateway for exchanging data. Third, an interoperable payment system, ability to move money in a, uh, with different systems in, in an interoperable way. And fourth is an electronic consent system which empowers people to share data to third party. So part of the foundational layer connectivity, we talk about payments. So what is happening today between Singapore and Thailand, Singapore, India, Singapore, Malaysia, Singapore, hopefully other market, is we are laying the layers of connectivity, which allows all the underlying complexity of clearing payments, settling play payments, and the process of providing the right form factors to accept payments getting standardized. The market participants have to build the innovation on top of this layer because it is not, it's not, we're not solving a lot of, of course we're solving a lot of problem by putting a smart QR payment. It's just a form factor. What we, what we need to solve for is the underlying rails, which may not be visible to be far more efficient because the single biggest barrier today is still the cost. Banks are still charging excessively the FX margins to the when the between the when the when people transfer money that has to go down. We cannot be uh, in, in this DNA where electronic transaction is going to be the main uh, main process to to drive digital economy. We got to get down the cost structures as as small small possible and focus on the business value. What comes on top of that? In fact, one of our discussion with our counterpart in India. We talk about expanding the message layer to other data, which can then the, the banks can use for providing other kind of financial product on top of that. So, 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 so our focus is to remove the policy barrier, remove the infrastructure barrier, make the form factor standardized so that people can innovate on that when it comes to payment industry. So that's the, that's the real focus and that's what we are, we are trying to achieve. I think that infrastructure public good layer is like incredibly fundamental to the conversation here today. And I think I turn the conversation back to Abraham. You know, the at the, at the end, you know, we we heard from Kun Payung, we heard from Subnandu about having that infrastructure connectivity. And at some level, that it means the payment systems operator. So love to hear a payment systems operator perspective. You know, tell us, help us understand a little bit more about how you see your interface with regulators coming into play to drive this connectivity. But as you look a step forward, we heard about fintechs and banks servicing and innovating on the in, on the payment services layer. From a payment systems operator perspective, how do you see the payment systems approaching the openness towards banks versus non-banks? Is, is it an either or choice? Is it both thing? Love to hear how you see this ecosystem conversation playing out. Um, sure. I mean, um, it's it's quite uh, complex, but I would like to highlight the three things basically. 
Uh, we did a survey about five years ago. I mean, for the uh, network provider in Asia Pacific. And basically the top three survey results are the security and the risk management, and then the uh, more agile and adaptive business model. And lastly, the core regulatory partnership between the regulator and industry. And first of all, I mean, for example, I mean, today with pandemic and the social change uh, induced by health protocol and the technology innovation, I mean, the industry basically, I mean, the network operator as well as the banking and uh, non-banks or fintech, we feel something will happen. <laughs> well, I mean, on the innovation side, but we don't know what we don't know yet what we will see. I mean, because the innovation is uh, almost like a speed of light. So, I think uh, for the industry, we would want, we would like to take a more prudent approach. I mean, considering again the innovation, the investment, as well as the uh, uh, the goals to support the small and medium enterprise. So we take a prudent approach to advance with a new digital payment interface in a progressive way to create and stimulate the user experience. Um, and about the again, I mean the cost efficiency as well as the. Uh, the noble objective to reach the small and medium enterprise. Totally agree, I mean, for uh, for such a noble uh, objective. What we would like to uh, highlight is, again, the advanced development of the infrastructure and then the uh, security uh, enhancement, because it is a never-ending race with the fraudster, as well as the uh, service level, uh, maintain the high service level to the uh, customer or all stakeholders, some way and somehow it will still need the investment. And we, we are not talking about uh, we we don't we don't like the objective of the cost efficiency, but we would like to brought up the to bring up the balancing between those three critical success factors. Uh, for example, I mean, in Indonesia, I mean, for the small and medium enterprise, we provide for them, I mean, based on their uh, asset and also, I mean, the, uh, their size, we provide them with the uh, zero MDR, basically, for a certain period. And again, I mean, this is to create the demand for their service and product, because again, the infrastructure and the development uh, we see uh, it is only one side of the coin. We provide the access to the digital payment. But how can we also support the demand, I mean, for the digital payment services and also the product? So it is not only, I believe, it is not only the responsibility of the uh, financial institution and the central bank, because once we open, for example, with the uh, QR code C2C, and then we move to B2C, and then to B2B, I think we will have the uh, basic foundation, really, uh, a strong basic foundation to move forward. Hi, Abraham. Thank you very much. I, you talked a little bit about innovation at the services level, and naturally it links to innovation at the infrastructure level. I think now's a, take a, a good point to take a look at some of the innovations that are happening at the infrastructure layer today and just get some perspectives from our panelists today. Uh, Kun Payong, uh, as a bank that sits between the payment systems and the beneficiaries, in other words, the consumers and merchants, you know, you, you stand at a very unique nexus of these relationships. Love to hear some of your perspectives on cross-border payment in innovations. For example, do you feel like the latest hot thing on central bank digital currencies might be an interesting innovation to catalyze more cross-border payment services? We'd love to hear some of your perspectives. Uh, Kun Payong, you're on mute. Okay, thank you. Um, Sure. The uh, the, the cross-border services are mostly a case about reconciliation, which takes the unnecessary usage of time 
this area can definitely be a low-hanging fruit that CBDC technology can yield a much better experience. The technology will eliminate the needs of nostril account, beneficiary parties, and interbank protocols. With less parties, the service is lean and as simple as an efficient service should be. Not only the speed, but also the simplicity of the back office processes are the result of the CBDC. Moreover, this might also increase trust in the ecosystem. With CBDC, it gives a sense of G2G platform or G2C uh, uh, or G2G standard that will embed in the cross-border services. This can allow a new player to participate in the market. The new players will bring in new approaches, practices, or technologies of which the market will learn from and will adapt and improve. In the end, while the market have better ground to compete, the clients will definitely just enjoy the better services and CBDC will pay a critical part of that. Thank you, Kun Payong. It sounds like there is a pretty high prospects for, for CBDC. Uh, now I'd like to take a little bit of a slightly different angle. You know, we talked, we heard a little bit from uh, Kun Payong yourself, uh, Subnandung, Pak Abraham, not just about bilateral connectivity, but potentially blowing that up into multilateral connectivity. Uh, Tara, back to you again. You know, we earlier heard about the importance of the standards work that the CPMI Secretariat is driving and shepherding. Could you tell us a little bit more about where the role of standards might come into play to address some of the challenges you see in blending these bilateral connectivity into multilateral linkages? Love to hear some of your perspectives uh, from a CPMI secretary perspective. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so um, the CPMI has a set of standards. We have them jointly with IOSCO. Uh, we call them the principles for financial market infrastructures. Uh, so these standards um, are internationally agreed among our CPMI members, and we leave it up to the national jurisdictions to implement them. But of course, national jurisdiction implementation, um, you know, it happens at different times and in different ways, and there's different institutional structures and, and, and legacies. Um, so Sopnandu raised this, this issue of policy alignment at the beginning, and, you know, it's really critical that we further... Um, harmonize our policies so that we can start to build and connect these multilateral linkages. Um, one of the key challenges of standardization um, is the standardization of things like payment messages or the development of, of conversion or mapping tools between uh, payment systems. Um, and if payment systems are going to be linked, they need to be able to understand each other, to talk to each other. Um, one other issue that I raised um, earlier is the alignment of legal, regulatory, and oversight frameworks across jurisdiction. This is really a prerequisite for mitigating the various um, risks that we have in cross-border payments, um, such as legal risks and credit risk. Um, so let me talk about one project, that's Nexus. Nexus is a project by the BIS Innovation Hub in Singapore, and it creates a blueprint for connecting fast payment systems across countries. So the idea behind Nexus is that it, it, it seeks to overcome the complexity of creating multiple bilateral links by providing a more standardized way for domestic payment systems to speak to each other um, through this multilateral linking arrangement. This arrangement consists of both a, a technical platform, which is called the Nexus Gateway, and a governance framework, which is called the Nexus Scheme. So such a, a blueprint or an arrangement as Nexus could help in an overcoming these technical and, and the operational challenges I, I raised So to, to better harmonize policies and, and, and increase and enhance that policy alignment. Um, but, but progress on interlinking in this way can't be accomplished just in a vacuum. Um, the development of these, these arrangements is really going to benefit from the effective delivery of, of the other um, cross-border payments building blocks. Um, and one of the uh, big tasks that we have set, aside, set out for ourselves is to, um, is to look at the interdependencies between, um, between all these different building blocks. Some are actually dependent upon success in, in other areas to be able to, to make progress. 
um, and I, this is, this is a, you know, critical area for, for interlinking as well. We need to better align, for example, regulatory supervisory and oversight, oversight frameworks, and that will help us apply AML CFT rules more consistently. Um, yeah, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. You know, I think, you know, you, the remarks you gave, I think is the stepping stone to the perhaps the most exciting topic personally for me uh, in this part of the panel, which is stargazing a little bit into the future. You know, we heard already from Park Abraham, from Kun Pai Young, from Sibandu and from Tara again, about what are some of the successes we've experienced to date, one of some of the key factors as a vector for the momentum we're seeing. So, you know, now is a good time to take a bit of a reflection point to see what we've learned today, if COVID-19 changed the game, and perhaps based on the data points that we've known today, how can we extrapolate that to a trajectory that we might expect? So this is my favorite part. I love to ask this question is that I'd love to hear it from each of you and just have enough time uh, to talk about what you see as the vision for cross-border payments. So uh, Tara, I'll just kick it off with you again since you last left us off. So tell us a little bit more about how you see the future of cross-border payments. Thanks very much. Um, so let me start quickly by looking back. Um, our work in 2020 and 2021 really focused on laying the foundational elements for future um, progress, future roadmap actions. We've completed a number of uh, stock takes of existing systems and arrangements. Um, actually, in this year, we'll produce internal and external something like 14 reports. So the next stage of our work is going to comprise not only further analysis, but we're going to propose material improvements of underlying systems and arrangements, as well as the development of new systems. Um, and so one point I'd like to make is that in order to achieve progress in a timely manner, the planning and budgeting of such enhancements in, in various jurisdictions is going to want to begin soon. Um, this is going to require global co coordination and, and also sustained political support. So to my, um, to my vision, what it won't be, let's start with that. It won't be one mega cross-border payment system. The future state in, in my mind will include a number of diverse solutions, We'll see a variety of interoperable payment arrangements ranging from multilateral service level agreements through payment system links like, um, like the ones that we've been discussing here today. Um, but it's not only the development of, um, of existing systems. The building blocks include elements to um, also promote the development of new systems. So there's there's three building blocks in the in the roadmap that are forward looking and they look to the future. Um, 17, which we've been talking a little bit about today is multilateral platforms. Building block 18 is fostering the soundness of global stable coins. And building block 19 is the international dimension, factoring the international dimension of CBDCs into cross-border payments. Um, let me just close with, with, with three points. You know, ultimately, we think that everybody should have a right to be able to make low cost, fast and transparent cross-border payments. And we also think that people should have a choice on their provider. If, uh, if relevant stakeholders around the world can help to implement the building blocks, the cross-border payments program, we really do expect to see market enhancements uh, in the future. And let me close by also saying that um, the future state should also ensure that everyone has access to a good version of money. And by that, I mean safe, um, like central bank money or commercial bank money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. Uh, Abraham, what about you? What's your vision for the future of payments and cross-border payments? Yeah, basically, I mean, the, uh, your question is also reflect the conclusive building block of CPMI because the first one is the uh, public-private collaboration. And based on our experience, the collaboration is a must between a bank, non-bank, fintech, as well as the industry and the regulator. Because uh, based on our experience, for example, I mean, it's not the operational or technical issue. Sometimes it took uh, quite a long time to achieve the regulatory harmonization and then uh, to uh, achieve also the more symmetric regulation between bank and non-banks. And lastly, how to create demand for uh, pay digital payment and also the product for the, uh, in this case, we, we take the SMEs. Because uh, I think the, the probably the danger is uh, at the moment, one of the focal point in payment is making 
platform faster. And uh, I'm just uh, worried that we are we are too narrow, focusing on the uh, faster platform. But again, we forget the other critical success factor, because what we, what uh, what I see is the regulatory harmonization and then the balance between uh, bank and fintech is very very uh, crucial also, and also probably the the support from the forest hunter from the trade ministry and or trade sector to also uh, enhance the product uh, as well as the services of the uh, small and medium enterprise because all of those factors will create uh, something like i mean uh, if i can use the analogy cross border is like a language when the entire system uh, can run faster if we can all speak speak the same language of those uh, three factors i mean the innovation uh, regulatory harmonization innovation and cost efficiency Thank you very much, Pat Abraham. Uh, Kun Payong, what about yourself? What What is your vision for the future of cross-border payments? Well, um, I think what we've been seeing is uh, is is uh, very hopeful in in terms of collaboration uh, between um, our, our private uh, uh, partnerships, uh, the uh, uh, between the uh, regulations uh, in country, cross country, cross region. Uh, and I think that that is the key as a, uh, a basic foundation uh, or backbone for for trade and services, uh, which are key to drive the uh, economic growth and uh, prosperity across the region. And most importantly, the uh, collaboration, the connectivity uh, with all stakeholders have taken into account uh, the, the 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 use of uh, technology uh, to enable. The, uh, the, 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 the effective cost to serve and also uh, to uh, ensure the inclusion uh, that all parties and all players can come in and play and be engaged in the, uh, in, in the uh, not only the, uh, the region, but also uh, through time will be the global uh, trade and services activities. And, and this will definitely drive uh, the, uh, uh, the prosperity and the economic growth uh, uh, across the region and, and with this uh, uh, synergy, it created a lot of the, what I would call multiplier uh, to drive the inclusion and the, uh, uh, what I call inclusive growth uh, uh, across the region as well. And at the end, uh, it will strengthen uh, uh, the, uh, the foundation of the uh, regional economy uh, into the global context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim Payong. And we'll cap it off from a central banker's perspective. Uh, so Nendu, what's your vision for the future of cross-border payments? Uh, Daniel, look, uh, re uh, regulation is given, it should get simplified. Cost of transfer should get close to zero. And I, then we don't have to talk about inclusion challenges. And the end point accessibility to digital payment should be to everybody. If we really want to paint the picture, ten, uh, like 20, 10 years, 20, 20 years from now, my biggest bet will be that the way we think about payment will dramatically change. today. We think about payment as a mechanism to send value from A point to B point, transfer of value. The future is going to be a single transaction where the value will transfer and the ownership of the asset will also transfer. That is called decentralized finance, where you're moving both into a single transaction, you are going to price for the ownership of a transfer, not for the value of transfer. I think that's where the future lies. That's where the excitement of CBDC lies. That's where the excitement of the smart contract lies. I think we should start going at to that end point faster than ever. Thank you very much, Sumendu. I'm excited too. I'm really excited to see what happens next with MAS Vision. So with that, I'd like to bring our panel to a close by summarizing with what our panelists have shared with us today. I think consistently we've heard three themes emerge from the discussion. One, that there's a greater need, perhaps an imperative for policy alignment across borders, across nations, across regulators, which leads to the second, we talked a lot about ecosystem collaboration from the banking layer to the operator layer to the regulator layer, and that's interlocked across this dynamic ecosystem and it's certainly a key ingredient to make this work. And lastly, it sounds like if we get one and two, right, then we're able to achieve our shared goals, perhaps of a social responsibility where payments embraces the concepts of openness, a diversity, 
and inclusion, which I feel are you know incredibly important topics of our time today. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much to our panelists, uh, Pat Abraham, Kun Payong, Sopnandu, Tara. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you for joining us and sharing us with us your perspectives. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm your moderator for today, signing off. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>